Welcome to this week's episode of Promising Young Surgeon, the show where we peel back the curtain on the culture of medical and surgical training and explore ways to improve the journey for the next generation of physicians. Today, we're tackling a topic that is as important as it is difficult, physician suicide. This conversation is crucial because despite the prestige and the rewards of a medical career, the pressures and challenges can lead to devastating outcomes. To help us understand this issue and explore ways to best support our colleagues, I'm joined by Dr. Jesse Gold. First, I'd like to go over some of the relevant statistics from the literature. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has some great resources and data. Each year in the U.S., roughly 300 to 400 physicians die by suicide. In the U.S., suicide deaths are 250 to 400 percent higher among female physicians when compared to females in other professions. In the general population, males complete suicide four times more often than females. However, female physicians have a rate of completion equal to male physicians. Medical students have rates of depression 15 to 30 percent higher than the general population, And major risk factors for physician suicide include depression, bipolar disorder, and alcohol and substance abuse. Female physicians have a higher rate of major depression than age-matched women with doctorate degrees. So I think that there's a lot of interesting trends that come out of this data, especially when they're matching women physicians with even women in other high-powered fields or with really advanced graduate degrees such as doctorates. Medscape surveyed 9,175 physicians in their 2023 physician suicide report. 9% had considered suicide and 1% had attempted it, whereas the average for U.S. adults in the general population is 4.9% and 0.5% for attempts, respectively. Finally, I want to highlight a specific important new study that was published in BMJ this August 2024. And it's suicide rates among physicians compared with the general population in studies from 20 countries, gender stratified systematic review and meta-analysis by Zimmerman et al., So the objectives of the study were to estimate age-standardized suicide rate ratios in male and female physicians compared with the general population and examine heterogeneity across study results. In terms of design, this was a systematic review and a meta-analysis. For the data sources, they looked at studies published between 1960 and March 31st, 2024. And in terms of eligibility, there were observational studies with directly or indirectly age-standardized mortality ratios for physician deaths by suicide or suicide rates per 100,000 person years of physicians. And there was a reference group similar to the general population or extractable data on physician deaths by suicide suitable for calculation of ratios. So for the results of the 39 included studies, 38 studies for male physicians and 26 for female physicians were eligible for analyses, with a total of 3,303 suicides in male physicians and 587 in female physicians. Across all studies, the suicide rate ratio for male physicians was 1.05, and for female physicians, the rate ratio was significantly higher at 1.76. The suicide rate ratio for male physicians compared with other professions was 1.81. So many valuable, you know, thought-provoking conclusions from this study, including that, well, number one, standardized suicide rate ratios for male and female physicians have decreased over time. However, the rates remain increased relatively for female physicians. The findings of this meta-analysis are limited by the scarcity of studies from regions outside of Europe, the U.S., and Australia, but these results call for continued efforts in research and prevention of physician deaths by suicide, particularly among female physicians and at-risk subgroups. What I want to highlight from this study, and kind of this is distilled down to the news highlights, um, the meta-analysis of all the studies here found that male physicians 
faced a 5% elevated risk of fatal suicide, while female physicians faced a 76% elevated risk compared to the general population. So as I mentioned in the conclusions, the second analysis that they did found that rates of fatal suicide among doctors have decreased significantly in recent years, but that female physicians are still at a 24% elevated risk compared to the general population. Jesse Gold is the Chief Wellness Officer of the University of Tennessee System and an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. This inaugural leadership position encompasses all five of the University of Tennessee campuses and includes 59,000 students and 19,000 faculty and staff. In her clinical practice, she sees healthcare workers, trainees, and young adults in college. Dr. Gold is a fierce mental health advocate and highly sought after expert in the media on everything from burnout to celebrity self-disclosure. She has written widely for popular press, including the New York Times, The Atlantic, InStyle, Slate, and Self. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in anthropology, Yale School of Medicine, and Stanford University Department of Psychiatry, she spends her free time traveling with her friends, watching live music, especially Taylor Swift, or mindless television. And she loves to go on walks with her dog, Winnie. Her book, How Do You Feel?, releases this October. We're in the final countdown here for release. <laughs> Jesse, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I love so much that you mentioned, you know, your appreciation of live music. Like I'm I'm here in Nashville. I'm definitely a live music enjoyer myself. But what I notice is this thread of Swifties on this show because, you know, myself, our producer Grace we're we're all Swifties here, like truly welcome. Oh, yeah. You know, I think maybe it's the emotion part of it and how it resonates with different parts of our lives. But who am I to say? Taylor Swift is definitely the poet that we don't give credit to. Agreed. I mean, I think that some of that we take for granted. And what I have really appreciated about some of the writing that you do, some of the content that you create online, like, even incorporates Taylor Swift lyrics to kind of destigmatize certain mental health issues or concerns that we grapple with. I have had this like weird ability to become like a mental health and Taylor Swift expert. And I don't really know how that exactly happened. But, you know, there are a lot of times where, you know, what she's writing about, you can explore in more depth from a mental health perspective. I even got to teach in the Taylor Swift class here in in the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And I taught about mental health self-disclosure in Taylor Swift. And that was awesome. Wow. Well, that that's like really incredibly cool to me. And of course, part of your varied career, you know, I appreciate you coming on here today. And of course, we're recording this episode for Physician Suicide Awareness Day. So again, incredibly serious, but also equally important topic. And I appreciate you being here to share your expertise and kind of dive into conversation with us today. Yeah, of course, of course. I would love to begin by kind of talking about the scope of the problem. Physician suicide rates are alarmingly high compared to the general population. And so what do you think are some of the key factors that contribute to this? It's a really complex problem. Like, I wish I could say it's this and we fix this and we're good, but suicide itself is a very complex issue in a mental health. And so I think when we think about this, we have to think about it from a lot of different avenues. I think one is systems. So there are a lot of issues in systems in healthcare that are contributing to people not being able to do what they want to do, not being able to help people the way that they want to help people. And that contributes to burnout, distress. Um, not enough sleep, not enough eating, all these things that can eventually lead to poor mental health outcomes. Um, You know, I think some of that is documentation. Some of that is, you know, insurance companies role in our jobs. Some of it is practice sort of parameters, and that definitely contributes. Then I think there's a cultural aspect of it, which I think we probably don't talk about enough, which is 
how we talk to each other about these things and how mental health is discussed. So because we see anything that isn't perfection as a weakness, we don't talk about our mental health because it could mean that someone else is going to beat us in a competition or do better than us. Or maybe it looks like we're not as good at something as we think we are. And all of those run counter to things that I think got us into this field in the first place, which is like overachieving and perfectionism. And so as a result, we tend to kind of push down, push down, push down until things are pretty bad. Um, And then, you know, it can lead to us then going, oh, maybe we should ask for help. But then we, I think, get scared to ask for help because of stigma, fears of what everyone else is going to believe, and some fear of like losing our license, which is a kind of longstanding fear that I think has seen some change over time, particularly more recently in in terms of like some of the wins that the Dr. Warner Breen Heroes Foundation has had with changing some of the licensing language. But I think that's still lore that's passed down culturally. And so we have fears around that. And so, you know, if you think about it as at least like a bucket of system factors and a bucket of cultural factors, they kind of um, come together to make it really hard for people to ever seek help. And if they do to kind of hide it when they get there. I really, I love that framework. I definitely get what you're saying and I appreciate the nuance of what you're talking about because of course, approaching this as a multifactorial, you know, problem and a multifactorial set of risk factors is, I think, very realistic and also very fair to all of us. Like it's not, you know, it's not just one thing. And of course, there are like incredible resources and programs nationally that are trying to address different pieces in the systems bucket, I think, you know, like burnout, kind of like reduced burden of documentation, EMR requirements, things like that. But I do want to certainly hone in on and really, really think about the cultural bucket that you're talking about. And one reason for that is because I do think that in terms of all of us being in control of ourselves, you know, these culture changes can be promoted at the individual level. Like I, I agree with what you're saying about the lore because I have always been told, you know, when I showed up to training, people were like, do not share any of your weaknesses because honestly, this person, X or Y attending, X or Y senior resident, if they smell blood in the water, they'll kill you. Like I would just not share, you know, so if you have a health issue, like let alone a mental health issue, if you have a physical health issue, do not disclose it. Like it will be used against you. And so I think that that's an example of the type of thing where, you know, um, gradually as individuals kind of promote a different kind of culture, you know, certainly one where maybe we're like more compassionate towards people (laughs) who like all of us, like all of us at some point are going to have Uh, you know, physical health and mental health issues, I think, realistically. So, you know, and not not having these perfectionist standards is part of the start there, I think. I appreciate that you mentioned control, because I think a lot of times when I talk about these issues, so many people kind of get frustrated when I talk about the things that we can do ourselves, because they want the system to be fixed, and they want the system to be fixed tomorrow. And I've never approached this where I don't acknowledge that the system is a huge contributor. But I think that what each individual person can do to fix the system is a lot more complex. And like, not everybody has a direct access to be doing what I'm doing in my role, for example. And so it can feel very futile to just be mad at this broken system that's been in existence for so long. And to be able to say, well, I can control how I talk to my coworkers. I can control the space I'm creating for the residents that I'm taking care of. I can control the space that the med students get when they come on a rotation with me. These kind of things that feel simple maybe, but really do make a difference because you create a really safe space for people to feel like they can talk about these things, to ask for help, to know that you're you're not perfect and you've needed help before in your life too. And I think we take that for granted, but the little things will end up making a better culture for all of us. And, you know, things like what you're saying with being sick and not wanting to miss or, you know, having a condition that you don't want to mention, you know, there's studies that show that like 
we're getting a little more comfortable with physical health disclosures in, in med school, but not with mental health ones. And I think that makes perfect sense because if you ask people, there's always some, again, lore of like this story of someone who's like actively hemorrhaging, but they're still at work. So that's great. And we have this belief that that's like a sign of being cool and a sign of really like cutting it. And so if like your bar for missing work is so, so high, because for the most part, you should be bleeding actively while you're at work, then where does mental health like even fit on there? It can't because most people can't see it. And so you have to really like completely change the way we're viewing this stuff and say like, actually, it's not cool that that's a thing. And we shouldn't be praising the person who's throwing up at work while dragging an IV pole while seeing patients. We should be saying you're seeing patients that's dangerous, or maybe you should take the time to take care of yourself or something, right? And that's a cultural reframe of like, you're allowed to have human things and human needs and take care of yourself. And the fact that you ignore them is not a plus, but we frame it like it is. Right. Agreed. And as a, you know, ex-surgical resident, um, we had co-residents who were before shifts when physically ill or exhausted, you know, or what have you going on, would go to the emergency room and just like pull aside a friend, you know, an acquaintance, a nurse and be like, hey, I need these IV fluids, like just put a put an IV in me. And then they wheel away with their fluids, kind of like what sounds like such an insane cartoonish depiction of this person, like this resident rolling around with their IV pole and their fluids. But um, that, I, you know, I've experienced that in my own residency. And I do think that what's so interesting, too, like I, I do think a lot about and I try to provide kind of these stories and almost like companionship or the ability to relate to like residents and fellows and things like that. But honestly, in terms of the broad scope of the problem, I want to share that re- more recently, you know, I'm in my third year of practice and I'm an attending earlier this year, I basically, you know, my eight years of severe abdominal pain, of course, just ate it for all of residency, never even thought to have it looked at. It flared up. And I ended up in the emergency room. That led to the OR. That led to a diagnosis of over 20 bleeding ulcers throughout my stomach, throughout my duodenum, mostly stomach. But I mean, it was like the pain was to the point that I could not uh, collect really my thoughts at work. Like I was like in clinic kind of having trouble concentrating. I was like, if I can't breathe, this is probably too much pain, right? Like, and then I was taken in, you know, to the ER that evening. But what's crazy is when I shared this story among a lot of like kind comments from colleagues and things like that, this one person on LinkedIn, a lady I do not know, commented on my post just saying, hey guys, like don't ignore your health problems for eight years. Anyway, that's how I got 21 ulcers. Like what's up? And uh, she, her reply was, if you can't even take care of yourself, how can any of us trust you to take care of us as an ENT doctor? And I was like, what? I'm, I'm kind of catching strays from this lady who I don't know on LinkedIn. But I think that that's very representative of how even for physicians in practice and things like that, there is this perception even more insidious than what you've mentioned, where not only do doctors expect doctors to be perfect and healthy at all times, mentally and physically in perfect health, but the general public also expects that of us. Yeah. And I think even you could look at her comment a different way too, which is like, we think it's cool and good that we like finally took care of ourselves and look at this story. And really, we probably should have done it all along. You know, I think sometimes we think things like patients expect certain things of us or want certain things of us. But if you told them I had 20 ulcers before I took care of myself because I didn't want to miss like operating on you and taking care of you, they'd go, uh, maybe you should have gotten that taken care of at one. Right. And I think our perception of them like 
wanting us to sacrifice is probably actually untrue. I think there's a lot of, you can use the word burden. It comes up all the time in my patients' conversations, right? So if you miss work, you will burden people. (laughs) It's just plain and simple. Like you will have someone have to cover or cancel patients or all of this stuff, but maybe that's okay, right? But I think that we very much think it's not and we're trained that it's not or the system's really set up to not support us in that because of lack of redundancy, particularly in training. And I think we really like learn this show up or you're hurting someone else or making someone else mad. And I remember at points like even being mad at people on maternity leave. And I'm a female who's a feminist who I caught myself doing it. And I was like, that's bad. Like the fact that my brain goes, well, I didn't have a kid. So why do I have to support all these people who did? Like that is a bad setup, right? But it's a setup that's caused by a system that has no redundancy in it that is set up to make it so if you can't come, you're putting that on someone else or affecting patients. And, you know, I think that concept is really hard to get out of. Like my personal therapist will often say, Like, why do you need an excuse to miss work? You know, like, do other people tell you that they're throwing up in order for them to miss work? Like, why do you have to clarify how sick you are in order to ask off? And I never really thought about it because when I thought about it, other people don't tell me where they're going on vacation and prove that they're not at home. And other people don't tell me that they're like what what sick means to them. But for some reason, like when I have to ask to cancel patients or something, I have to be like, hi, in case you're wondering, I have 102 fever and I'm throwing up, please cancel patients, right? And so I think that that like need for explanation comes from this culture of like earning it and you have to prove it. And I'm trying to get out of it as a, even a, you know, as a longer like time attending. Um, but it's like really hard to get out of my head. But I, why do I owe people an explanation? If I'm sick, I'm sick, right? I don't know. Yeah, that's so true. And I mean, because now that you say it, I'm like, that makes perfect sense. But I really identify with that burden that you're talking about. I was part of a small residency, like 10, 11, 12 residents at any given time. So yes, if one person was missing or sick, it had really insane consequences for everyone else. What I think is interesting as well, and one thing that I think could be done differently and probably in bigger programs is not an issue, is that there was never much leeway from the side of the attendings. So those residents had to sort out a way to still cover the amount of work, whether one resident was missing or two or or whatever it was. Um, By the time I graduated, there had been a couple years of a missing class of residents the year behind me. So for years, we made up the amount of work that an entire missing class would be responsible for. And I've heard of other programs doing things differently in terms of like, you know, culturally, every institution will have its own idea of like, well, hey, if we are absolutely strapped on the resident side, resident and fellow, maybe on that side, this attending is going to go uncovered for X, Y, or Z. And that's okay. That's the attending like, you know, kind of stepping in and and helping out the team. But it's really tough when there's a fixed commodity, which is number of residents, and maybe it's like 10 And there's an amount of work that kind of like 13 bodies would need to be present for to cover. And so I think that some of it has to do with what I think of as old generational culture where there's a lot of rigidity and there's a lot of hierarchy because that hierarchy means that when I have seen also these things go off the rails, let's say that it's a junior who's out because yes, it's bad enough like if a resident God forbid, gets very ill or if a family member of theirs dies. Like it really, you know, everyone else is like, okay, this is going to be so much work for us. Everyone else is like worried about how it will affect them, which I get to an extent. But when it's a junior, then I've heard a lot of rhetoric where like the senior is saying, why the hell do I have to go see that consult? This is like junior work, right? Or again, like the attending kind of being like, I cannot do this clinic without a resident. So you have to shake out a resident from somewhere else to, you know, cover that. 
Yeah. I mean, there's a funny Glockham Flecken video kind of on this because everything he does, I feel like, is a kind of biting narrative on these things, but about like a resident trying to call out to go to something in a year and he asks for like recommendation letters and all this stuff. And then he said, like, what do you expect? Like the attending to do it basically, you know, like who's four years, like do the work of four years, their junior and this whole kind of like statement that just sounds ridiculous when you hear it, which is like, of course the attending can do it, but they just don't want to because they feel like they earn to not anymore, you know? And yeah. I think that's really hard. I mean, my residency program, I always liked that. Like when we had didactics, they like actually covered and took our pagers and all of that because it doesn't always happen. And a lot of people are like supposed to be in didactics learning and they get paged out or they get like told to go take care of something or they're covering all their patients at the same time. And at least like for that, they like really did preserve our time to learn. And wow. I, I felt like that was like a really good thing. I realized it's kind of small in like a half day, but it did make a difference to go like, oh, look, they can survive like for a half day without us. And, you know, I've seen attendings not ask for the coverage when someone was sick too, which also was helpful to see that like it was modeled. You know, I think if it's never modeled, then when you get there, you feel like you're supposed to, like you're not supposed to not have a resident, right? Like you're supposed and that you're to it. it. Yeah, like you, you earned it. And that's what you get now is a resident, right? And I think our, our hospital system is built on the back of residents who are underpaid and overworked and need to be allowed to be human. But we haven't really figured out how to fix that because it's built on them. And so we do need like to shift the sort of expectation of what some people do in other roles to support them, to be honest. I think that's where you get a lot of issues with like unionizing and stuff, like people do kind of get worried that <laughs> the power is going to shift more towards the attendings having to do more and maybe they should and maybe it was set up wrong, you know? So we had Dr. Sossenheimer on the show a few seasons ago and he led some of the Stanford house staff unionization efforts um, back, you know, a couple of years ago when they really like, you know, they they made a huge move and successfully did unionize. But what's so funny, because I love talking to him and like hearing with his expertise, he can just debunk all these really common, like what you're referring to questions about unionization. And he was like, one that I get a lot is that residents will be like, what if the attendings get mad at us? Like, and then, you know, and then they don't like us anymore. And that affects like our friendship and relationship, you know? And he was like, that is already kind of part of the problem. If you think that the attendings view you as friends, you know, or like if you, if you think that this is going to damage like a really positive relationship that exists, that kind of by definition means that maybe you have a misunderstanding of your relationship to your attendings and how you're viewed by them. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think we probably all do. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, I'm a, I've never been a fan of hierarchy. It's all over my book <laughs> because I always found it really challenging. I appreciate it from a knowledge perspective, but I think it makes it really difficult to to stay yourself, to be yourself, and to be a human because there are so many expectations coming from power, um, and that isn't great. And I mean, you're in a, you were in a specialty that, you know, really did focus a lot on that more than mine does. But I didn't like those specialties in medical school for the same reason, because I just felt like I was this person and I was a full human and I was already out of college and in my 20s. And, you know, like I knew who I was in some capacity. But when you start with a culture that tries to tell you who you should be, it becomes really hard to stay yourself and to stay like I'm an empath to the core and to really stay that way is hard when people tell you you shouldn't have feelings, this shouldn't make you react, that you should just be able to go see someone die and then go eat dinner. Like when that's what is told to you or people sort of like, you know, mistreat you in hierarchy and assume that that's okay, then you sort of like start losing yourself a bit and trying to mold what 
they want you to be in this culture that's poorly designed to support us. And I think that makes it really hard for people too, because it, you can feel pretty lost in that and, and like lost to your sort of like authentic core values as a human. And I think that can contribute to depression and burnout and, and anxiety and all of the stuff that we struggle with too. Absolutely. And I know you touched on this earlier, but in terms of the stigmatization of, you know, mental health for healthcare workers, yep. you know, what are the best ways for us to combat this, you know, and, and what ways can we fight against? I know you brought up the incredible work that the Dr. Lorna Bring Heroes Foundation does to kind of at the licensing and credentialing level make yep. changes happen. Yep. But I mean, I guess I would ask at the individual level. And then this more systems licensing admin level. Yeah. I mean, I think it surprises people that we stigmatize mental health so much, given that we learn about it. We know the biology of it. We know the signs and symptoms of it. We see patients with it. But I think that, you know, when it comes to applying it to ourselves, it's very different than what we see in patients. And I'm I'm guilty of that. You know, I realized I stigmatized myself for being on meds and had no idea because I'm spending all day telling people like me, it's totally normal. And I believe it. Like, I'm not lying to my patients. But I when I sort of like looked at why I wasn't openly talking about being on meds, like deep in there was somebody will think I was sicker at some point. Somebody will think I'm not as good of a doctor, like people will judge my sort of emotional reactions within the context of a of depression. And so I had to work through that myself. And if I have to do that, of course, everybody else does. Like I'm, I've, I've, I shouldn't stigmatize mental health, right? And so inherently, it's, it's in the air that we breathe a little, I think, like what's modeled, I think how people react to mental health patients on their floors makes a big difference. Because there's a lot of negative like comments about frequent flyers or like this person's bothering me and angry and crying or whatever it is. And that gets mm. can get attributed to mental illness. And it's not always mental illness. Sometimes it's just they're in pain or sometimes they're just confused. And a lot of that comes out as emotions. But what you hear as someone who's struggling is like, I'm going to be made fun of for this. I'm going to be judged for this. I shouldn't be this. And so you don't want to be labeled that because it's seen as other or, or viewed differently. And, you know, there there's a study of med students where they like ask them, you know, do you feel like getting help for mental health is like a weakness or means something bad about you? And they basically at very low percentages said yes. So they don't think it is, but they say my colleagues will, my residency program applications will view it differently. My patients will view it differently. My supervisors will view it differently. So we could come in fully aware that this is fine, that there is no stigma, that it's the same as that mental health is health. But we can be told and fear what we're told or what it, how it will be used against us by our peers, our supervisors, uh, the next step of applications. And as a result, when they ask them sort of like, if you got help, would you talk about it? That percentage is very low. So they hide mm -hmm. it. And once they actually choose to get it or they don't get it. And that's how we get to the numbers that you're, you know, you started this conversation about, which is really, really troubling. And that is a result of like so much like fear and stigma that comes with what it means to be struggling in our field. Um, you know, I think it counters the examples of what they tell us we should be <laughs> Um and, and so we see it modeled in the curriculum. We see it modeled um, in how we deal with people with mental illness. We see nobody is talking about it. You know, so you said, how do we change it? We talk about it, right? So I I am a person who openly talks about like kind of the most I could talk about it, <laughs> like my whole book's about it. But I've talked about being on meds. They talk about going to therapy. I'm totally comfortable. And I made that decision um, because of my role, because of who I'm seeing, because of of what I think it is needed. But I don't actually think we all need to do that to change this. I think we need some people just like we need a Selena Gomez, right? Like we need a Simone Biles. We need some of these people who do model mm -hmm. it in, the, in their fields. But I think we do all need to talk about some of the quiet stuff out loud. Like 
That was in a really I great way that. that, you know, like, you know, yeah. how, how that's hard sleeping in medicine, medical school is challenging or in residency. Like, how did you balance that? And like saying some of this stuff that like, we all know is true, but we don't admit, like, if you go to lunch after a code, maybe talk about that. Like it is, you know, our timing is not great. I wonder if we could talk about what it's like to witness a code and then go eat lunch, you know, like some of these things that we just kind of take for granted and don't have open conversations about really could change the way that we view this stuff and sort of see it as part of the like culture that it's okay to say some of these things out loud. Like it's okay. Cause once you start talking about not sleeping or it being hard, or you become a person where people know they can, they'll mention the other stuff. Like it opens the door for the other stuff. And you don't have to be like, I am Jesse. I have depression to open the doors to the other stuff. Right. But it, it does right. Inherently people tell me this stuff all the time, but it doesn't have to be that for everybody. And I don't want to force that on everybody because it's not fair to it's your story you can do what you want with it totally but you know and i will say you know that i really admire what you do and i do think that it's iconic behavior you know your book you sharing your story the therapy like i i myself am a super fan of therapy you know i've talked about even like my hypnosis experience here on the show and things like that um it definitely means a lot. And yes, I love the Simone Biles, the Selena Gomez's of the world like that. That helps all of us because even though I guess, yeah, you know, they're not in medicine, they're just like Olympians and pop superstars, like everything that most of us want to be. But it does, I think, help even these younger generations really normalize those conversations and it to illustrate that even people at the top top of their incredible professions and at the top of their game, you know, have some of these experiences. What I will say in to build off of, you know, this one point that I really think is important is that people should be mindful of those types of comments that you were mentioning, right? Like just being like, oh, that patient, yeah, whatever, they're annoying. They're bipolar and annoying. It's like people can hear you when you say that stuff. They internalize those messages, especially younger people. Like you might be a senior when you're saying that type of rhetoric. You might be an attending now and you have a whole team listening to you. So like they hear you. I mean, I assume this is the same as like parenting, right? Like your your little crew, like they follow you, they look up to you, they internalize those messages. And what I would remind everyone is that sometimes you would not know that this person on your team, right, is dealing with any mental health experience of their own. So you're saying all these derisive things, thinking like, well, I'm cool. We're all cool people here. No one has mental health issues, but like they may have them and they're just not comfortable talking about them with you. That doesn't mean that you should just be making, um, you know, judgmental comments about all of that. I will say that when I was about to graduate residency, I remember I had lunch with one of my great mentors, like a person who I would actually say I was pretty close to, a great attending taught me so much about ENT. And, you know, I was like looking back and I was like, that was crazy, huh? I was like, man, what a crazy ride. You know, I really like, I was suicidal for most of fourth year. And the attending was like, what? And I I was like, what do you mean? What? Like we were talking that whole time. I told you. And the attending literally was like, I thought you were kidding i never took any of that seriously they were like you said it in such a funny way and i was like well that's just because i'm funny like i and i kind of have gallows humor but like that does not mean i was not kidding you know just kind of fyi and it was just like really it was interesting to me to hear that feedback of like maybe part of the reason why everybody ignored what i was saying and going around muttering to myself is because they just thought it was like kind of a long running joke. Yeah. I mean, there was a time that people often use that as a joke or like a comment, like, I'm just gonna do this to myself. And I think that that 
people have learned not to do that as much, I hope. I mean, I would hope that if you wonder if somebody's joking that you ask, I think that we worry about talking about these things, but in talking about it is actually helpful. It doesn't plant the idea. It makes people feel supported. And I think we forget that part of our training if you're not in psych. Um, you know, when you're talking about modeling stuff, I would just also add that like when you're calling a psych consult or involving psych, you shouldn't be going Ugh, psychiatry and like belittling the field because it does the same thing that it does to belittling mental illness patients. Right. And so if somebody is like, oh, this person needs a psych consult because they're really struggling with their mental health and you're like, oh, good, let's call psych. They're like barely even doctors or whatever, you know, I know I've heard about my field like that just contributes too, because like, why would they go see this like fake doctor to take care of them, right? When they might need it. And so keeping in mind that the stuff that you say about like calling psych or needing psych or, or our jobs too makes a difference. And I try really hard not to ever disparage another field, even though like they are different cultures and it does contribute. Like when I'm talking about this stuff, I'll say stuff like surgeons are different and the culture of surgery is different, but I don't want to say I hate it or there's something wrong with it or, you know, because that's not helpful for people who are interested in going into it. So I try really hard to be like, here are the things that I've noticed that are different that might contribute to different stressors than another field. But, you know, it's hard. I, I think that it's hard not to do that. But I think for for psych, like keeping in mind that that does also people are also watching and also wondering, like, is that a valid form of asking for help? Mm -hmm. Like, is that a real doctor that I'm going to like, and it needs to be seen that way. Yep. I, I totally agree with you. I could not agree with you more. This topic of specialty disrespect, it's a real problem, you know, at some scenarios more than others. I do think that this is perfect because this is all on the same major point, which is that like people can hear us. Like people do, people are around and listening and they just even subconsciously kind of internalize these messages, maybe sometimes harmful rhetoric that happens at the hospital, whether it's like mm -hmm. a person talking about a team member, talking about a patient in front of others, talking about other teams in front of patients. And of course, you know, every version of that relationship. I do want to ask just in terms of some kind of practical pointers for all of us, you know, what are helpful, you know, it's tough, but I mean, for lack of a better word, like warning signs that a physician may be contemplating suicide and then what any of us can do to respond or support a colleague in that situation. I think one of the biggest things you'll see is a behavior change, right? Like I think we think like, oh, somebody's just not responding to emails because they're stressed out or we say, or like somebody showed up late because they slept in, you know, whatever. And we, we excuse a lot of this stuff, but the earlier stuff you see starts to be those like sort of little subtle behavior changes. They're not showering. They're not coming on time. They're not replying to emails. They made like a little error that you caught or wrote something that they wouldn't or, you know, that kind of thing. So paying attention to the people you see regularly and like the way they interact is really important. I don't know that you're always going to see somebody who's like, crying all the time or, you know, really depressed in some really obvious way, I think you're probably going to more likely see some sort of behavior change in somebody. Um, you know, I think anger is a pretty common emotion, like, uh, for us to settle on because it's acceptable. I think we're like being angry, especially in certain specialties is a, is a, is a form of sort of power too. And so I think that sometimes when we're angrier, it's about more than just like whatever we're angry about. And so if you start to see somebody like actually being angry to colleagues or, or interacting with patients in a way that they don't really like that could be something that you would want to check in on with them to, you know, obviously like change in sleep, change in eating, change in functioning, things like that, which might be more signs of depression um, would be something to be paying attention to, too. I mean, I think sometimes people also start making statements that don't have future involved and, and say are like future limited and you can pay attention to that as well. Like, oh, if I was going to be here, I would do something like that. Or, you know, these things where they're just hinting like they're they're already thinking about not or there's a reason they would not. Um, you know, I think some of that is subtle and someone might not say that to you. I think the hardest thing is that some of this stuff 
you might not notice in the context of our work environment where we're not sleeping, not eating, and not functioning very well anyway. And so you want to be paying attention to your friends and your your team early and being able to notice those signs because you are paying attention and you are asking and you are checking in. And so I think, you know, checking in often and regularly is important. Like if you only start checking in when people start like messing up, let's call it like doing something at work that is like points it out, it actually will just make them kind of turn in on themselves more. Right. So if you've ever been in a situation where somebody says like, Hey, I noticed you're not doing your work. Your reaction is not to go, Oh, thank you for pointing that out. I've been really feeling sad. Your reaction is going to be, what do they notice? Am I really bad at my job? Am I a horrible person? Are you sure I'm not a horrible doctor? Did they just tell me I'm a horrible doctor? Right. And then you're not, you're going to either get defensive or you're going to shut down on yourself. Right. And so we want to be checking in in a kinder way. We want to be checking in along the way to notice more subtle things. We want to be encouraging our team to do the same, right? Like be checking on yourself um, so that you are a person that people will come to in these situations and be open about that. Totally agree. And that makes me think of like, I think at the end of the day, I would distill the reasoning behind that, at least when I think back to my learner experience as kind of like indicating buy-in from the person providing feedback standpoint. Like, yeah, if if, if it's only a check-in when things are going bad and it's just kind of sidling up to say, hey, you messed this up, that does not invite the same type of open conversation as somebody who, yes, routinely checks in, gives you positive feedback when they notice, okay, I, I have some some kind words for you on the way that you excelled at this. But of course, because I do want you to be the best doctor you can be, the best surgeon you can be, I'm going to give you all sorts of feedback. I'll give you all manner of like, you know, some constructive feedback, some positive feedback, Um some areas for improvement. And it's just like this holistic kind of buy-in because then that person may be able to view the other as someone who in good faith does really want them to be the best that they can be. I also think we don't do a very good job telling people we care about them and and telling them the good stuff, right? So I think that, you know, we worry about that as pa- like doctors too. And I will say to patients who are struggling, like, I just want you to know that you really matter to me and I would be really sad if you hurt yourself, you know? And I think probably that's a bit of like a, you could have a conversation with supervisors and me about whether that's the right thing to do. But I think it is important that people know that people care about them. Because when you get like that, you start to feel like everyone would be better if you weren't there. You start to feel like you're just a burden and you're, you know, it's, you, you know, you're contributing in negative ways to everybody and nobody cares or, you know, whatever, if you're, that's your mindset. And so I think it does help to tell people you're worried because you care, right? You know, not just, I noticed you're not responding to emails and that burdens me with your work, but I I noticed you're not responding to emails. It seems kind of different for you. I'm just a little bit worried about you. Can we talk about it? You know, like really openly saying like, you're a human. I see something that makes me concerned. I'm worried. And if they shut down and don't say anything, like don't let it be the only time you ever ask. I think that's the other big thing is like, Think about it like a parent and a kid. And if your kid slammed the door on you when you're when you asked in the moment, you wouldn't just be like, well, let's let that go. You'd eventually go talk to the kid that slammed the door. So trying to like the more times you do it, eventually people will let you in if they want to. And I think that that can help. And I think being open about some of this stuff like you're on my team. I see you every day. Like I really have noticed some of this stuff, but I'm a little I'm just worried and I care and know that I care is is important. Totally. Well, I I do really appreciate those helpful tips and like examples of the types of language that we can bring to those conversations because like those are even some some nice things that I am going to save to have in my pocket. Like that's super helpful. And thank you for modeling it for us. Of course, happy to. I do think that everything that we've been talking about, like these really big themes that emerge, you know, I know that you tackle a lot of this in your upcoming book. And and I definitely want to introduce and ask a couple questions about, you know, your book. This is the final countdown. Like it's just a couple weeks here, but it's called, How Do You Feel? 
mm-hmm. one doctor's search for humanity in medicine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the book does begin with you hitting what you describe as a breaking point. How did you get there? And what did the lead up to that moment look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, it feels subtle till it's not. And I I think that this is something that I hear in a lot of patients too. And I think is because we don't at all ask ourselves how we're doing. We spend so much time focusing on other people that by the time we actually notice something's wrong with us, we're pretty off by that point. Like we blew past those kind of early warning signs of struggling. And for me, I mean, and a lot of patients too, they'll say things like, well, I didn't hurt someone or I didn't like, you know, affect a patient and I'm still doing my job well. And I think in a lot of ways you are, but you're not doing it at a hundred percent or you're not doing it the way you would feel proud to be doing it. And for me, like it was a like probably slow and steady buildup, but what it actually felt like was all of a sudden I was sleeping every day after work and all of a sudden I was having trouble like focusing in patients and you know what I do in my job it's not that I'm going to like cut someone and make an error it's that I am not going to pick up on some subtle clue or I'm not going to ask the right questions or or I'm going to miss a chunk of what they're saying because my brain is like taking off in a different direction and I have to come back and say I'm sorry I missed that or something like that which feels horrible when you're, you know, basically the person that somebody's telling things they've never told anybody before. And so, you know, for me, it was like that, like it, it felt sudden, but it wasn't. And it was really because I was a psychiatrist seeing healthcare workers in the middle of a pandemic. And I was listening to story after story after story after story of, frontline workers struggling and feeling like one, I wasn't a real frontline worker because I was behind a computer and I had a ton of guilt about that and felt like I should be like doing more because if I was in med school or something, I could have been. But at the same time, I knew that my role was different and could be different. And so I wanted to be supporting as much as I could. And so I like threw myself wholeheartedly into as much of the outreach and education and, and, and listening that I could. And it was like, you know, a (laughs) hundred. Like I definitely cope with work and I overworked in, in a sort of overcompensating for some of the guilt for some of the things I was hearing for just wanting to be there for people with what my skill set could provide. And I just, uh, I mean, it just led to be burning out pretty royally, um, but actually not noticing or being aware or naming it that to be honest. Did you name it something different or did you just not notice that anything was not business as usual? I didn't notice until something was like off, Um, you know, like I was sleeping every day after school Mm -hmm. or after Mm -hmm. work, you know, like I was like, I keep saying after school, like I'm still in school. I don't know why my brain, that's such a, that's such a, you've been in school your whole life answer. Um, But, uh, you know, I think for me, I wanted it to be a physical thing. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I know mental health stuff. I know depression. I wasn't depressed. I didn't feel depressed and I was sleepy. So lots of things make you sleepy, like physical stuff, you know? And so I think that my brain wanted to name it lots of things that it wasn't, um, you know, I had low B12. I thought that was going to be the answer. You know, I think you sort of get to the point where you're like, it's gotta be like, someone's just going to give me a vitamin or a shot and I'm going to be awesome again. And I didn't really like even consider burnout, despite the fact that like I literally was like talking about it every second of every day. I just like didn't consider it like I didn't feel like that could be something I was dealing with. Um, And I think that kind of getting to that point took pretty long, which, you know, in the same kind of conversation as the stigma thing, like if I am if I can rattle off those signs and symptoms so easy and I can't apply them to myself, like why should anybody else? <laughs> and and I think that that's important for people to realize. Yeah. I think a lot of us have blind spots for ourselves and, and I definitely can appreciate that. And there just is something about like intellectualizing a problem or like for a lot of us and the people like us who, you know, go into medicine and become physicians and surgeons, um, 
it's very soothing to put things in a box. Like that's like my favorite activity is kind of like categorizing things and like what you're alluding to with the sleepiness being like, all right, it's sleepiness. And like further, probably B12. Anyway, like on to the next thing like that, like even just soothes my mind to think about it. Like, okay. And you know, otherwise, um, I'm not going to dig further into that. And and I have categorized it. I put it in a nice box. So, you know, I definitely, I think we all have that inclination. And of course, you know, I've had the opportunity to kind of get a sneak peek at your book and, and I'm just really excited for everyone to kind of learn from it. But what I'm interested in is your discussion regarding perfectionism. This is how we started the episode. We were talking about perfectionism, perfectionism in physicians and things like that. Um, But what are the different types and how does our understanding of it help us to better understand ourselves? Yeah, it was helpful for me to kind of dig into some of the perfectionism literature because I just thought, you know, this is me and my whole life I somehow absorbed that like I needed to get A's and I needed to go to a good school and then I needed to go to med school and then I needed to go to a good residency. Like it just was, you know, maybe some of it was explicit, but a lot of it wasn't. It was just what I was absorbing and putting on myself from like viewing my family and viewing other people and seeing what I should be doing as the smart one or whatever that is. And I think, you know, there are these two types, one's adaptive and maladaptive is probably the easiest way of thinking about it. And the maladaptive type is like, if you make a mistake, you don't really assume you ever will make mistakes. And it is like a catastrophic thing and it impacts your mental health. And a lot of us have that. Um, because we kind of envision this, like we compete and we care about people. And as a people who compete and care about people, we will continue to compete and do everything we can to never make a mistake. And somehow that is the way that we will live. And I feel the same about burning out. We somehow think we can do everything and we will never burn out because we are somehow different or somehow able to do that. And that's just unrealistic. But when you live your life with that like belief, it makes it harder when something does happen because you're not prepared. Um, the adaptive type, they actually can like fail and learn from their failures and, and grow from that. It's like they would like to be perfect in the ways that they're doing the skills of the things of their job, which is important for medicine because you would like to not, you know, ideally mostly be organized and not make mistakes where you can and that sort of thing. But, you know, they're more prepared for growing and learning from a mistake if you or a failure, if you want to use that word. Mm-hmm. You know, I think some people, you know, could go on the sort of Caroline Dweck, like growth mindset bit on here, but it's like, how do you deal with that? And and you can learn to be more adaptive in these things, but it does take work. And I think a lot of us don't feel like we don't have the time to do that work or it feels unimportant, but it that like reconceptualization of surviving and living and thriving and being aware that as a human who is still pretty darn perfect, you can make mistakes, you can burn out, you can get sick, you can struggle. Like that's how we sort of grow and live in this culture. Like I don't want to tell people not to strive to be the best that they want to be because I think we're going to, right? Like that's just in the air that we breathe. But it's how we do that in a way that is healthy and how we do that in a way that acknowledges the fact that sometimes it won't work. And sometimes we said yes to too many things. And sometimes we get sick because we get sick. And sometimes life interferes with work and sometimes work interferes with life. And all of that is true. And having like a baseline understanding of that and re sort of adjusting what it means to be doing this work as a perfectionist, I think is critical for all of us. Okay. I love that so much. And it like unlocked in me. This is something that my therapist said to me years ago. So this was my chief year in therapy. But when you talk about the maladaptive type, what really stands out to me, like you're describing it, you know, you're going line by line. And I'm like, I think at the heart of some of that, it is this rigidity, right? Which like a lot of, you know, I myself, I'll just speak for me. I'm not even going to shade like doctors on this one. I'm not going to be like, doctors can be rigid. Honestly, just I can be rigid. And 
historically, I was really rigid. Um, I do work a lot on transitioning from basically now I'm now I'm learning new language for it, right? Because like I'm transitioning from maladaptive perfectionism to adaptive perfectionism. But what my therapist said to me when it was about, yeah, I mean, expectations that we have of ourselves, expectations that we may have for team members, you know, certainly in the resident environment, expectations we have for other people in the hospital. Basically, he just told me learning to relate to your values differently can be done so that if they're not reflected in the world, then you don't perceive it as an existential threat. And I was like, ah, okay, that's pretty good. That probably, that sounds, that, you know, rings true in terms of like, otherwise, if we are rigid and we're very married to like the maladaptive perfectionism or certain expectations again of ourselves or others, like all of these times that it doesn't line up, it really is this existential threat. And, you know, kind of that, that jarring, uh, very taxing experience that you're alluding to. Yes. And I think it's really important that you understand your worldview and you understand these things. Like I, you get it because you went to therapy. I get it because I went to therapy. But otherwise, I would just say, like, why am I so mad about this? Or why is this so frustrating? Or why is this bothering me so much? And I think it really does help. You know, I think somebody asked me, like, kind of looking ahead to this, like, kind of busy bit of time. I have a new job and I'm also doing this book stuff, like how I'm dealing with knowing like I'm going to be that busy. And I said, I think I have this like awareness that like I will drop something or I will burn out and that's okay. Like the fact that I can't do seven jobs at once makes sense, right? But if you would have asked me that like I don't know, four years ago, I would have said, well, I love juggling stuff. I do 45 jobs. That's how I do my thing. I like write in the evening. I go to work in the day. I am good at all of it. And da, 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 right. Like I can do it all without dropping the ball. And like, that's just wrong. Right. And I think being able to say like, I actually am going to have to build in time to take care of myself. I actually am going to have to know that like something could drop. Like, that's a whole different mindset for me. And that mindset comes from work, you know, and I think that that work makes me better at my job. It makes me a better clinician. It makes me a better leader. And we sometimes frame therapy like you have to have an issue and that issue has to be getting worked on to be solved. But I actually think for a lot of us, our issue is dealing with our jobs and coming out human. And that's an okay issue to work on. And still, it might take some time, but understanding your like conceptualization of the world, your core values, the things that are really getting agitated in certain encounters, the things that like with patients might be an issue or with a supervisor might be an issue are really critical to all of it. And I think a lot of us just kind of take for granted that like, that's just how we are and that can't be changed or that's just a thing that's going on for now and it'll stop or whatever you want to call it. But I think really, you know, you can hear it in the way you speak. You can hear it in the way I speak. Like these are things that take time, but I think it's been really worth it for me because I, I feel a lot more healthy when I approach hard times or something happens or I'm trying to deal with something like my emotional reactions are okay. And the fact that I can't do something is okay. And I don't think I would have told you that before. Totally. I definitely, I I love where you're coming from. I definitely encourage everyone to at least consider therapy in a very real way because I would not know myself. I mean, I didn't know two facts about myself. I think they were like, you know, authentic um, before that level of examination. Cause I also, I would have been like, um, you know, I'm a nerd. I'd be like, I'm, I'm good at some stuff like none of that, but I didn't know the exact questions that you're saying where I was like, why am I um, feeling like people are not, getting what I'm saying or why am I not getting across things in the way that I intend them 
to be received, you know, and and just all these like very jarring mismatches between like internal and external state. And I will say that it was a very necessary and very real shift where um, I, you know, I couldn't possibly expend that much energy compensating for such a disconnect. And so it's been um, very survivable now to have those things better aligned because otherwise very taxing, very challenging to live that way, I think, over a long period of time. I do want to ask you a couple questions as we kind of close up here, but what Taylor Swift era are you in currently? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I only get to ask the Swifties, so I got to do it. Yeah, I mean... I don't, I, I like have a little bit of reputation in me just because I think it is in a little bit of inspiration to sort of go into a hard time, like that kind of music, that kind of vibe to be like, this is going to be, this is an important time. And you need like the, I need, I'm, I kind of like anger and stuff sometimes as like a motivation. So I, maybe I'm, I lean towards that, but I also cry a lot because I'm so productive, you know, <laughs> kind of that kind of thing too. Yes. Well, with the reputation era, what I really remember being struck by was like, I read this interview years ago where she was talking about, you know, of course, there was the feud with Kim Kardashian. There was like all the the snake emojis in like, I think a tweet, you know, like all the old lore. But of course, like Taylor then adopted the snake imagery for herself. And it kind of was this like Game of Thrones, Lannister style, like, if you make it your strength, People can't use it against you. Kind of like really embraced it in a way that I found very inspirational. Yeah. I think for things like where you know you're going to be vulnerable and people can say things, like I feel like that's where I need to be too is like kind of self-protective but aware and also aware that like that's their – what the way people view stuff is the way people view stuff and it's your narrative to define too, you know? Ooh, I love that. That totally makes sense for your book era, of course, right now. Book era. Um, this is my last question, but I did hear Adam Grant pose it recently, and I really loved it. The question is, what's something that you've changed your mind about recently? Oh, gosh. That's a tough question. Thanks for the tough question right here at the end. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, in the in the late evening. I know. Um, gosh. Is it weird if I say I changed my mind about the importance of sleep? (laughs) Because I think, you know, I think that I I roll my eyes about that a lot of my life. Like, oh, good. Like, of course you need to sleep. Like, because I actually could thrive on not a lot of sleep um, and be fine. And then I started to realize that that stopped being true at some point where I got older. Um, I think that this, like the sleep aspect and the sort of now becoming more introverted aspect are maybe things I've changed my mind on, which is like, I used to hate being alone with my thoughts. And I used to hate not having something to look forward to with friends and stuff. And the pandemic really changed that for me. But like, but also just sort of spending time on being okay, being by myself changed that for me. And so I do think like maybe both like how to conceptualize sleep in my life, but also change my mind on introversion for me. And like that, that's an option at times. And I don't have to just be around people for to feel seen and understood and heard and whatnot. I don't know if that's exactly what you were going for with the question, but those are, that's what comes to my head at the, at the moment. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I really appreciate you sharing. And yeah, I just, but I do, what I love about the question is that I finally think I can answer it. You know, that even alludes to a bit of, like I said, my past historically super rigid person. Like, I honestly think I didn't change my mind for 10 straight years for maybe all my 20s. And that was like to my own detriment. And I really like appreciate, I mean, there's a lot of brilliant people out there, thought leaders like Adam Grant, who you know, are are very adaptable and probably change their minds all the time on a variety, like just on a variety of topics. And so I think that that's such a cool skill and ability. And so, yeah, I appreciate you sharing with us, like, of course, ways that you have adapted and, and changed. So I really 
cannot thank you enough for yeah. sharing your insights and joining me today. Honestly, it's just all the work that you have done to support physicians for years now. So again, like it, it can't be overstated and I'm excited for your book to come out to the world. I also really appreciate that you've given us kind of some concrete tips and language um, that we can maybe even implement into our practices and our lives, particularly for Physician Suicide Awareness Day. And these are conversations that I hope we all continue to have. I'm grateful to start this here today. Where can our listeners find and connect with you online? So I'm at Dr. Jesse Gold on pretty much everything, you know, on the artist formerly known as Twitter, um, on Instagram, on TikTok. I have a LinkedIn. It's just you could get there with the same spelling of my name, which is Jessica without the C-A, <laughs> Jesse that way. Um, and the book is is like anywhere you can get the book. Uh, you know, you can get it from Amazon. You can get it from Barnes & Noble. You can get it from your local bookstore. Um Pre-orders really, really help me. And, you know, for this community do kind of signal to people that this topic is of importance. I think that, uh, you know, I think it matters to people beyond healthcare. And I hope that people feel that way. And, and whether that's showing it through pre-ordering my book, that's one way of doing it. But I think if you're interested in these topics, it will fill in some more gaps in the research. It'll tell you some more about stories and maybe you'll feel seen and connected to those. But you know, uh, anywhere you can get books that, that you can pre-order that too. That's perfect. And we'll definitely, we'll link it in the show notes down here for you guys. I already have my pre-order in. I am not playing around when it comes to this stuff. I feel like you guys know this. I'm always going on about one, really um, the importance of all of this that we're talking about. Follow me on Instagram at at francismay.md and at Rethinking Residency. Visit my website, rethinkingresidency.com, to learn more about resident physician stories and ways that residents can most effectively navigate the game of residency. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode of Promising Young Surgeon. If you enjoyed today's discussion, please subscribe and leave us a review. And feel free to share with your colleagues. If you'd like to submit any questions for future episodes, email me at pys at heyinfluent.com. 